Hello. So in this video, we're going to talk about Guan Han Ching's play Snow in Midsummer. Um, now, this is a Zaju play, uh, which is a uh, particular form of Chinese opera that combined dramatic performance with uh, music, often with sort of comic skits, these various elements, various performance elements blended together. Um, this is a Kung An style uh, Zaju play. That means it is a detective fiction story. And during the Yuan Dynasty, when Guan wrote, um, Kung An was very popular. Um, this, this sort of detective story, solving mysteries, figuring out who the murderer is, these kinds of things were extremely popular. Um, as always, I'm reading this out of the Norton Anthology of Drama. So um, the, the translation that I'm working from um, is by Yan Jianyi and Gladys Yang. Um, it's a it's a an interesting play. Um, the plot line is actually relatively simple, I would say. But as with kind of all opera traditions around the world, both uh, Chinese opera of its its various species, I mean, Hong Kong opera, Shanghai opera, there's different different types of Chinese opera. And I don't know that much about them and about the differences between them. But, um, but with European drama as well, Italian drama, uh, opera, French opera, things like this, the storylines tend to be fairly simple and they get developed through the performance itself. So in a way, reading Snow in Midsummer is kind of, you're losing a lot of the artistry of the performance. Nonetheless, I am reading it. I'm, I'm a textual scholar. Um, so the, the beginning of Snow in Midsummer, um, we have a character named Duo Tanziang. Um, Duo is a, uh, a scholar who wants to take the civil service exams, right? Throughout much of Chinese history, um, they had a robust civil service, a robust bureaucracy, and you studied very specific Confucian texts um, from the, the classical tradition in order to, to take these exams and how well you did on the exams determined if you entered the civil service and if so, at what position. So Duo is, a, uh, is an aspiring scholar and civil servant, but he owes money to Mrs. Kai, um, who is a sort of wealthy uh, local, not noble necessarily, but she, she's sort of an upper member of society. Um, and so Duo gives his daughter, um, Duan Yun, to Mrs. Kai in payment of the debt with the intention that Duan Yun will eventually marry Mrs. Kai's son. Apparently, this was a very common arrangement uh, during the, the period of the Yuan Dynasty. By the way, I, didn't, I don't think I sort of clarified for those who don't know when the Yuan Dynasty was. Um, Guan Hanxing's life spans sort of the latter portion of the 13th century into the beginning of the 14th century. So this is the era of Mongol hegemony in China, right? Um, the Mongols conquer China under Chinggis Khan, um, and then they establish what becomes the Yuan dynasty. Um, and, and Guan is working during this period. So that's what we've got going on initially. Um, Duo has left his daughter with Mrs. Kai on the premise that daughter uh, Duan Yun will marry Mrs. Kai's son at some point. Mrs. Kai renames Duan Yun as Duo Yi. So her father's name, Duo, and then just the letter E, I guess. Although I've seen this transliterated in other ways. So sometimes it's Duo Yi. Why I? Um, but I'm just going to go with Duo Yi because that's what uh, 
what this translation suggests. So uh, Dwoi is now renamed. Um, and then several years go by and uh, 13 specifically years go by. Um, Dwoi has grown up. She's married uh, Mrs. Kai's uh, son. Mistress Kai, technically. I don't just keep calling her Mrs. Kai. It doesn't make any difference to me. Um, so she's married uh, Kai Jr., I guess, uh, and he has died. So now Mrs. Kai is a widow, and her daughter-in-law, Duo Yi, is a widow as well. Um, there's another dude who owes um, Mrs. Kai money, Dr. Liu. And instead of paying, he comes up with the very novel solution of luring her to a secluded place and then strangling her to death. But his plan is foiled. You'll be pleased to know. Um, because two dudes show up, old Zhang and his son, Donkey. Yeah, Donkey. I don't, don't ask me, man. Um, I'm not the one who named my kid that. Um, so... Old Zhang and Donkey run off Dr. Liu, and then Mrs. Kai is like, oh, hey, I have a widowed daughter-in-law at home, and I am also a widow. And Donkey is like, hey, Dad, let's blackmail them into marrying us. Uh, so Old Zhang is now going to, is now sort of attempting to marry Mrs. Kai, and Donkey is attempting to marry Duo E. The problem is, Mrs. Kai isn't too keen on this arrangement. Um, she has her own money, she has her own position, and Old Zhang and Donkey are pretty poor and disreputable. So then, Mrs. Kai is not initially thrilled with this, and Donkey's response is uh, essentially. If you don't agree to marry my dad and for your and to force your daughter-in-law to marry me, we will strangle you again. So, I mean, that gives you a sense of who the fuck Donkey is and what he thinks is okay. Um, so, Mrs. Kai, in order to not be strangled to death, agrees to this arrangement. Um, Duo Yi is unwilling to accept this arrangement. She's just under no circumstances willing to marry Donkey, which in fairness, yeah, fair play to her. That's the right move with somebody who is literally like, I will murder your mother-in-law if you don't marry me. So Duo Yi refuses to marry Donkey. Uh, Mrs. Kai agrees to marry old Jang because she doesn't want to be strangled, which in fairness is understandable on her part. Um, but then Donkey's like, hmm, I have a new cunning plan. I'm going to poison some soup and send it in to Mrs. Kai while she's sick. And he gets Duo Yi to make her the soup, but then he sends her off to get more salt and vinegar to put into the soup. And while she's doing that, he poisons it. But his plan goes awry because um, Mrs. Kai is like, oh, old Jang, my soon-to-be husband, why don't you taste the soup first? At which point old Jang is like, hell yeah, I love me some soup. And he drinks the soup and dies. So now they're in a bit of a pickle because old Jang is dead, uh, clearly poisoned. And uh, Donkey says, all right, Duo Yi, here's what's going to happen. Either you're going to marry me, or I'm going to go to the courts and tell them that you poisoned my dad. And Duo Yi is basically like, yeah, I'm not marrying you. You're an asshole. She doesn't say that. She's very polite throughout the play. But she says, yeah, I'm not marrying you. We can take this to the courts if you insist. The problem that Duo Yi has when they get to the courts, is that as a woman, she has no real standing or authority to be believed in the court system. So the judge has her whipped, basically. He has her, her beaten severely to try and coerce testimony out of her. Um, this does not work. 
Guo Yi maintains that she did not poison Ol Zhang, which of course we know is true. Um, she maintains her innocence. The judge is not having this. He has basically decided very problematically from a justice perspective that Duo Yi is guilty because Donkey has said so. It's only when um, it's only when the prefect, the judge, um, threatens to beat Mrs. Kai that Duo Yi says, whoa, pump the brakes. I can't be having her beaten for this thing, so I will falsely confess to this murder. Um, the prefect is like, great, wrap it up, executor, I'm going for fucking golf or whatever, whatever the fuck it is that corrupt prefects do during the Yuan dynasty. But what uh, Duo Yi says after this, so uh, Mrs. Kai weeping says, Duo Yi, my child, it is, it's because of me that you are losing your life. Oh, this will be the death of me. And Duo Yi says, when I'm a headless ghost unjustly killed, do you think I will spare that scoundrel? Men cannot be deceived forever, and heaven will see this injustice. I struggled as hard as I could, and now I am helpless. I was forced to confess that I poisoned the old man. How could I let you be beaten, mother? How could I save you except by dying myself? So here we get this great contrast, this great Confucian contrast between Duo Yi's filial piety, right, which is central to Confucian ethics, um, and Confucianism, again, it, this is this is a massive undercurrent throughout Chinese culture, throughout Chinese history. Um, Confucius is the man in Chinese philosophy, really. Um, and so this idea of honoring your elders, obeying those in authority above you, and being responsible to those for those below you, these are huge Confucian virtues. Duo Yi is clearly fulfilling that Confucian virtue by saying, I had to sacrifice myself to protect you because you are owed my reverence. This is in contrast to the prefect who has a Confucian obligation to judge rightly, to judge righteously in the cases that he hears. And he's clearly failed to do that. So we have that great contrast. And again, this is the, the Kung'an part of this play, this, this solving the murder aspect. And this is specifically the subspecies called a false judgment play in which um, the authorities, in this case, the prefect, has made a wrong decision about who is responsible for this crime. Um, Duo Yi, before she, she's executed, um, Duo Yi asks that Mrs. Kai will perform the proper Confucian rites for her memory. Um, ancestor worship is a big component of Chinese culture, and reverence for one's ancestors is an element of Confucian philosophy. In this case, this is a somewhat ironic reversal of that idea because Obviously, Duo Yi is not Mrs. Kai's ancestor. She is her, her daughter-in-law. So she's a younger, a member of a younger generation, but she's going to be honored as one of the ancestors in, in this sort of pantheon of, of um, ancestors who are getting these specific honors. Um, but she also makes three prophecies. Um, she says here, I want to say three things, officer. If you will let me, I shall die content. I want a clean mat and a white silk streamer 12 feet long to hang on the flagpole. When the sword strikes off my head, not a drop of my warm blood will stain the ground. It will all fly up instead to the white silk streamer. This is the hottest time of summer, sir. If injustice has indeed been done, three feet of snow will cover my dead body. Then this district will suffer from drought for three whole years. When she is executed, these things happen. So there's this this, foresh, uh, this uh, foreknowledge she has. 
And it's not necessarily foreknowledge. That's I, that's not even the right way of putting it. Um, she basically, she says, there will be signs of my innocence, signs that I have been wrongly convicted and executed, and then those signs come to pass. Now, when we get to the next act, the final act, act four, um, Duo has returned. Duo's back. Yay. Um, he's now a high court official in charge of uh, sort of overseeing justice done throughout the provinces. Um, he initially has come back to and and has sort of briefly looked for his daughter, but then people have been like, yeah, we don't know any Duan Yun. Uh, so then he was like, okay, well, I guess they moved. Case closed. Uh, at which point he settles down to do his actual job, which is to look over the judgment rendered by this prefect um, to try, I guess, to try and figure out why there's a drought going on in this province. Although that kind of, if you actually understand weather patterns, doesn't make any sense. But, you know, that's how it goes. Um, so he's basically checking up on the legal system here. And the first case uh, file that he looks at is Duo Yi, and he's like, hmm, that woman has the same name as me. Maybe we're related distantly. But then he's like, ah, eh, that case is salt, so I'm not going to look at it. But then Duo Yi's ghost shows up and is like, boom, this case is now back on top of your pile. And he was like, what? I just looked at this case, and I thought I put it on the bottom of the pile. Bottom of the pile. Duo Yi's ghost, boom, top of the pile. So eventually, uh, this just sort of keeps happening um, over and over and over again. And then uh, finally, Duo Yi's ghost just shows up and is like, listen, motherfucker, I've been putting this case file at the top of your, your pile for a reason. I'm your daughter. I was accused of this crime. And Duo is like, uh, basically, he is like, why did you do this horrible crime? Um, I, I am ashamed of you. And he, he sort of lists these Confucian duties for a wife to perform um, and for a daughter-in-law to perform. And so so he initially is, is critical of her, believing the judgment. But then Duo Yi just tells him the whole thing. He's like, yeah, uh, Old Zhang and Donkey tried to basically threaten slash blackmail Mrs. Kai and I into marrying them. I did not want to do it uh, because it would be disrespectful to my former dead husband. Um, then Donkey poisoned his dad accidentally while trying to poison Mrs. Kai. Um, I took the, the blame for this so that Mrs. Kai would not be punished and I was unjustly killed. At which point Duo is like, what? Oh, this is this is bad stuff going on here. I'm going to go out right now and have Donkey executed and have this prefect stripped of his office. Literally, like, no further investigation. Literally just a ghost shows up, says, hey, I was unjustly killed by the, the legal system. And Duo is like, well, that checks out. I'm going to come. I'm going to upend people's lives and have executions done on your word. Duo is the anti-Hamlet. He is the exact opposite of what Hamlet does, right? Because in Hamlet, um, the title character is like, oh, there's a fucking ghost of my dad here telling me he was murdered by my uncle. Maybe I should spend four hours fucking trying to figure this shit out through these convoluted, unnecessary means. Duo, on the other hand, just ghost has told me, Good enough for me. No need for further investigation. No need to check any of this stuff out. I'm just going to go and treat this as the truth. And this is actually one of the really ironic reversals of Snow in Midsummer. Um, Guan takes the Kong An style, the detective fiction style, and, and this is a reverse judgment play at this point, where a judgment that has been made is reversed. But Guan like, completely undercuts the ethos of it, because there is, it's not reversed on the basis of I found evidence that this judgment was incorrect, or or I've actually done anything. Is literally just the ghost has said it. Therefore, boom, here's where we are. 
Now, there's a couple of other things that I think are really worth uh, talking about with this play. The first one is a stylistic element that's very characteristic of um, Zaju drama, um, very characteristic really of opera, but especially of this uh, species of Chinese opera. And that's a lot of repetition. Um, so like a character will introduce a plot point, will introduce themselves or, or an, another character, and then the next character will give us the same information. And we get this right from the beginning. So the first things that we see um, in Act 1, we have Mrs. Kai enter. She says, a flower may blossom again, but youth never returns. I am Mistress Kai of Chotsu. There were three of us in my family, but unluckily my husband died, leaving me just one son who is eight years old. We live together, mother and son, and are quite well off. A scholar named Duo of Shanyang Pre uh, Prefecture borrowed five tails of silver from me last year. Um, five tails of silver, um, da, 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 if, this, if this measurement helps you. Um, it was slightly more than an English ounce, if that's helpful to you. Um, a scholar named Duo, Duo of Shanyang, Prom, uh, Shanyang Province borrowed five tails of silver from me last year. Now the interest and capital come to ten tails, and I've asked him several times for the money, but Mr. Duo cannot pay it. He has a daughter, and I have a good mind to make her my daughter-in-law, he then he won't have to pay back the ten tails. Mr. Duo chose today as a lucky day and is bringing the girl to me. So I won't ask him to pay me back, but wait for him at home. He should be here soon. Enter Duo Chan Zhang, uh, leading his daughter Duan Yun. Duo says, I am master of all the learning in the world, but my fate is worse than that of other men. My name is Duo Chan Zhang, and the home of my ancestors is Chan Ung. I have studied the classics since I was a child and read a good deal, but I haven't yet taken the examinations. Unfortunately, my wife has died, leaving me this only daughter, Duan Yun. She lost her mother when she was three, and now she is seven. Living from hand to mouth, I moved to Shanyang Prefecture in Chuanzu and took lodgings there. There is a widow in this town named Kai who lives alone with her son and is fairly well off, and as I had no money for traveling, I borrowed five tales from her. Now, with the interest, I owe her ten tails. But though she has asked me several times for the money, I haven't been able to pay her. And recently, she has sent to say that she would like my daughter to marry her son. Since the spring examinations will soon be starting, I should be going to the capital, but I have no money for the road. So I am forced to take Duan Yun to Widow Kai as her future daughter-in-law. I'm not marrying my daughter, but selling her. For this means the widow will cancel my debt and give me some cash for my journey. This is all I can hope for. Ah, child, your father does this against his will. While talking to myself, I've reached her door. Mistress Kai, are you at home? So again, we get this sort of immediate repetition of the same pieces of information. Mrs. Kai is wealthy. Duo owes her money. Uh, Mrs. Kai is going to get Duan Yun, later Duo Yi, uh, to marry her son when they grow up. We get this repetition twice immediately right off the bat so that's a that's a pretty common technique here and one of the reasons i think that might be is the idea of repetition and variation is really really common in a lot of chinese literature particularly actually poetry um there's a lot of chinese poetry uh if you look at at stuff for instance from the classic of poetry, which I've done a video on before, um, there are a lot of poems that have variations on a theme. And the idea is you sort of develop an idea, you develop an impression through repeating the same core idea, but with slight changes. And the artistry comes in imagining the variations on this central idea. And I think we get the same kind of thing in Snow in Midsummer, where because each character presents similar information over and over and over again, we're getting 
slight variations. We're getting different views of that information from different characters' perspectives.